On the 28th of July 2014, Pope Francis was on a private visit to the Pentecostal Church of the Reconciliation in Caserta, a town situated near Naples in Italy. He had just met his friend, Pastor Giovanni Triatino, whom he had met in Argentina in 2006 when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. This meeting is just one of the many encounters Pope Francis has had with leaders of the Evangelical and Pentecostal churches. Everything began in January 2014 with a video message from the Pope, filmed by his friend Tony Palmer, addressed to leaders of the charismatic evangelicals who had gathered for a conference in Texas. This video had a massive impact and was circulated all around the world. It led to a meeting in Rome on the 24th of June between Pope Francis and a delegation of Pentecostal and evangelical leaders among whom were the televangelist Kenneth Copeland and Jeff Tunnicliffe, secretary of the World Evangelical Alliance. Tony Palmer had been the catalyst for this unprecedented meeting. However, just a few weeks later, on the 20th of July, 2014, he was killed in a motorcycle accident on a small country road near Bath in England, where he lived with his wife and two children. In this film, we should like to pay tribute to this man, who was a builder of bridges between our churches. Signed this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace through faith to good works. And I believe that's something that needs to be fixed. There's a challenge for you. His legacy for us is his desire to overcome the obstacles that exist between Christian denominations, particularly between the Catholic Church and the Evangelical and Pentecostal churches. Tony Palmer was born in the United Kingdom and raised as an Anglican. At the age of 10, he emigrated with his family to South Africa. This was where he met his future wife, Emiliana, of Italian Catholic origins. They would then both be converted to Jesus Christ together in a Pentecostal church. And since that day, something happened to myself and Tony individually. Uh, our lives totally got catapulted, if you want to go it that way, just like Paul the Apostle. Um, in the road of Damascus. It, it was just an amazing conversion. Um, I come from a, quite a wealthy family, so I thought I didn't need much. Um, wonderful family, wonderful father and mother and wonderful sister. But there and then, our life just totally changed. It was a miracle. And um, then we needed to understand what was going on with us. By doing so, we started studying the Word, studying the Bible. And we went to Bible College Seminary together, and then the Lord called us, both of us, uh, in full-time ministry. So we left everything, careers, wealth, everything, and we said, okay, we're gonna live for you, Jesus. What do you want us to do? And that's when we left everything and we started this pilgrimage of full-time missionaries in South Africa. In 2002, Emiliana and Tony founded a community called the Ark Community, which gathered together Christians from different denominations, seeking to return to their common first century Christian roots. Tony was ordained as a priest and then as a bishop of the Communion of Evangelical Episcopalian Churches. Thanks to his close relations with the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, he met Cardinal Bergoglio, the future Pope Francis, in Buenos Aires in 2006. He talked to him about his family life. Tony started talking about the family, how myself and the children, because we both have two children, Daniela and Gabriela, which they both are um, Catholics like me. We couldn't take communion together. And that just totally broke. Father Mario Bergoglio's heart. 
and he just embraced Tony physically and said, you know, your pain is my pain. One thing that I can say is that the pain that my family and I feel every day is excruciating. The loss of Tony has been, and it is still now, something that I cannot accept. But I have to surrender to it. Um, I understand that I see him as a martyr. I see him that, that he died in a way like all the martyrs do. And the seed, the seed that he has planted had to die. And he was a seed and, and he had to die. And now we need to wait for the, for the fruit to, to, to grow. I know within my heart he's not dead. He's just not present here. But he is not dead. Tony's not dead. Tony's alive with the Lord and he's cheering, cheering us on to go forth and carry on with his work. When my father passed away, it was as if, like, everything had just disappeared. Like, when my father died, it was like everything left with him. And I honestly felt like there was no point in, like, staying. Um, so it was really hard for me. But I can say that this has brought me closer to God in like a different way. So my heart literally like craves, like I thirst for Christ way more than before. Also because I know now that the closer I am to Christ, the closer I am to my dad. And because my dad used to live like Christ, that's what being Christian is, is being Christ-like. Now that he's passed away, it just made me realize how important that is and how he always lived a full life. And that's what I want to do. Before my father's death, for about two years before that, I was a very strong atheist. Um, I was an atheist in the sense that I didn't believe in God. I wasn't angry with God or I wasn't angry with religion. I just thought that it didn't make sense. My conversion to Christianity was a slow process, really. It took about a month where I started to understand that there is a deeper aspect of human experience. The day my father died, before I knew he had actually passed away, I then started to feel the urge to pray. Not because I ran out of options, but because I felt that there is something in me saying, just pray. And I started praying and I felt this, this uh, overwhelming presence. And once I, got, I came to England, because I was in Italy while um, my father was, was in hospital, once I arrived, I actually found out he had died. And I think for most people, that would have actually said, uh, showed them that God doesn't exist. Or, but for me, it actually, for me, yes, I was incredibly devastated, but it showed me that there is something deeper. Tony's, for me, Tony's main legacy is about the Ministry of Reconciliation at every level, reconciling us to the Father, us to ourselves, but also us to the world and the different branches of the body of Christ to one another so that we may be one as Jesus and his Father are one. That, that's the key. That's the key legacy, I believe, that he's left us. When I met Tony Palmer in May 2014, and he told me uh, his story, he said that there had been one point where he was considering converting to Catholicism. Uh, he was at the time, he had been made a bishop, in fact, in, in his communion of, of evangelical Episcopal churches, but he was finding the strain, the pressure of living on the frontier too great. But Cardinal Bergoglio dissuaded him. He said, no, you are better being where you are on the frontier, uh, you know, who is living, if you like, both traditions with integrity. And so he encouraged him really to stay the same, to divest himself for the sake of mission. Uh, he was doing the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing together these two different traditions, not at an academic level, but in his own life, in his own family, in his own marriage, uh, and in his own vocation.
and we had a Catholic Requiem Mass here in this church. It was an amazing and unique occasion, I think, because I, I would say the majority of the people were not of our Catholic tradition. But we had a Requiem Mass that reflected Tony's life and his hope. We had the very best in evangelical tradition with the very best in our Catholic tradition. But I think Tony's legacy is that he knew every Christian is a brother and sister, that every Christian has the potential to belong to the family of the church. And his heart was that we be one Christian family and that through the Holy Spirit that is possible. Tony Palmer was a pioneer, a builder of bridges, a man who had a heart for spreading the virus of unity, as he wrote to the Net for God team just a few days before his death. How can we deepen these ties between the historic churches, the Orthodox, Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran and other Reformed churches, and the new churches which have appeared more recently, the Evangelicals, Pentecostals or Charismatics? Together, we are going to try to understand how to create a dialogue between these older churches and these newer ones, who currently represent a third of all Christians and are growing rapidly, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere. To go deeper into these questions, we went to meet some pastors, theologians and church leaders who are involved in ecumenical dialogue. Pope Francis's visit here to Caserta is something completely new and unprecedented. It's an historic moment. This is the first time a pope, not just this pope, but any pope, has visited an evangelical and Pentecostal church. A completely new thing. It's something that changes the cultural climate in a country like Italy. What is the Holy Spirit doing? I have said that he is doing something different, which some people perhaps might think is about division, but it's not. The Holy Spirit makes diversity in the church. It's in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. He creates diversity. And truly, this diversity is so rich, so beautiful. But then, the same Holy Spirit creates unity, and so the church is one in diversity. And to use a nice word from a Protestant that I like very much, a reconciled diversity through the Holy Spirit. He does both. He makes a diversity of charisms and then a harmony of charisms. This is why the first theologians of the Church, the first fathers, I mean in the third or fourth century, said the Holy Spirit is harmony because he makes harmonious unity in diversity. My idea is that the kingdom of God is about relationship, because God is relationship. God is koinonia, God is communion. So, starting from meeting as brothers and sisters, from the discovery of the Holy Spirit in the life of our brothers and sisters, the reformers speak about the interior witness of the Spirit. From this discovery of relationship, we rediscover ourselves as brothers and sisters. Friendship is established, and this is a ground on which we can build very solidly.
During this meeting in Caserta, Pope Francis asked for forgiveness in the name of Catholics for the persecutions of Pentecostals in the years 1920 to 1930 under the Mussolini regime in Italy. Io sono pastore dei cattolici. Io ti chiedo perdono per quello. Two days later, the Secretary General of the World Evangelical Alliance, Pastor Jeff Tunnicliffe, thanked the Pope and added, In history, there have been situations where Catholics were victims of discrimination on the part of Protestants, including Evangelicals. The relationships of the Pope with Evangelical and Pentecostal pastors, with the friendships formed in Argentina or more recently, are characteristic of what we might term a theology of meeting. Yes, as a way to Christian unity, uh, the encounter of persons is so important because we see this, first of all, from the model that we see in the Gospels. Jesus encountered people. He encountered them where they were, no matter who they were or what they did. And I think that's what is most important today, that in the past we were afraid of differentness, of diversity. And so we avoided that. We didn't go towards it. Today, I think, the, the, the energy that is found again in the ecumenical movement is the fact that we have dropped our fear of one another. And so we move forward together as people who are on a journey together. When Pope Francis was inaugurated, uh, it was a real honor that as a Pentecostal, world Pentecostal leader, to be invited at his inauguration. And uh, I had a very personal time with him. And when I went for the inauguration, I shook hands with him. I gave him a, a letter, a, a Pentecostal message in a letter, and I presented it to him. He was so delighted. He uh, welcomed me. And I had a very good uh, f uh, time of just sharing with him. I, I consider. Uh, from then, I, 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 I see the, the Catholics are not what we need, what we used to think they were. <laughs> that they are very, very open, and, uh, and I, I enjoy the fellowship with the Catholics now. Um, I, I think that um, it is very important that we return to the understanding of what baptism means for us. Because there, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we know that sometimes we have good brothers and bad brothers, good sisters and bad sisters, but we still are brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think that's where we have this encounter where Pope Francis, for example, wants to meet people where they are. Whether they're good or bad brothers or sisters, they are still my brother and sister. And that is what needs to be healed by love and the joy of the gospel. Catholics, Orthodox, and Evangelicals seem different in every way. What is it that unites or separates them today? What are the challenges we face? What brings them together? The first thing is that at the heart of Protestantism, the Evangelicals are the people who all believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ, true God and true man, crucified for the sins of the world, raised on the third day, etc., Basically, the faith, which is the faith of the Church, the faith of the First Councils. This is the foundation of all the Evangelicals, and it's a shared foundation with Catholicism and Orthodoxy. So I would say that theologically there's a common core, which seems obvious to me, and besides which our differences seem almost anecdotal. They're not without theological importance, but in an unbelieving world, that which unites us seems to me to be huge next to that which divides us. The second point is spirituality. This seeking, basically, for communion with God. This emphasis that is put on prayer and on sanctification, on the experience of a relationship with God. 
I think the Catholic Church, throughout its history of spirituality and mysticism in the evangelical world, even if the language they use is not the same, in fact have points in common that are very close, so I believe. And then the third point, which brings us together today, perhaps more so than in the past, is that we are in a society where ethical questions play an important role. And I often have the impression that in society's ethical questions, the ethics discussed in major political debates, etc., evangelicals and Catholics have extremely similar positions. Between Catholics and Evangelicals, even between Orthodox and Evangelicals, I think the first challenge is the challenge of our idea of the Church. On the one side, we have churches which are structured, which have an Episcopal structure. These are churches which have an internationally and nationally visible structure. While for the most part, the evangelical world lives in communities of a congregational nature, with a multitude of local communities and neighborhoods which are totally autonomous. So this is the first challenge. What does Christ want? He came to gather all the scattered children of God. Does he only want them to gather in a spiritual way, or does he want them to gather more visibly? I think that the determining factor for me in the Shamanath community is the testimony of fraternity. This testimony of fraternity has led me perhaps to a greater, a more radical extent than I imagined, and this happened in a very simple way. One day, whilst I was living in an abbey run by the Shamanath community, and for me, an abbey is very visibly Catholic, with, for example, its statues, its symbols that I don't know at all in my church. I said to myself, but after all, I'm really also serving the Catholic Church. Is this right? And I felt that the way in which I was asking myself this question was not quite right. So I went to pray and I really asked the Lord for a word. The moment I went into that oratory to pray, I was greeted by a word during evening prayer, and it was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And this word struck me, stopped me in my tracks. It was saying to me, but this is just what I'm asking you. And I also heard, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, as you shall love the church of the other as you love your own church. And that for me was not at all obvious. I know, of course, that I was called to love the other churches, but to love the other churches as I loved my own, for me that was new. And that was a big shift, which is still big today. But I believe it's one that's still guiding my life today. Because when all said and done, this means you shall be as concerned about the future of the other churches as you are concerned about the future of your own church. An image that often comes to mind is that of the Mediterranean, a unique sea on which so many countries border. Italy, France, Spain, North Africa, etc. But we have this unique sea in common, which is like a metaphor of baptism in the Holy Spirit. So we drink from the same sea, we drink the same water, we swim in the same water even if we are from different countries. Beginning with this shared experience, we can go a long way, in my view. I think that one of the issues of dialogue between evangelicals, Pentecostals especially, and Orthodox, 
for whom the theology of the Holy Spirit is very important, is to try, beyond particular experiences and beyond vocabulary, to manage to understand that it is the same divine person who is at work in each of us. And that this spirit which blows where it will, and which sparked this movement, is also the one who brought us this ecumenical movement and who wants us to be able to say together, Jesus Christ is Lord. No, I think that's the force that the world needs today, is the energy of the risen Christ that brings new life, new hope, new energy to all of creation. Um, and this is what I think the, the spiritual renewal in each of our ecclesial tradition and churches is bringing about. I can now take this yoke given from the Lord and carry on the work as much as I can. On the 10th of October 2014, Emiliana Palmer met Pope Francis with a delegation of bishops from the Communion of Episcopalian Evangelical Churches. Her son Daniel filmed them with the same smartphone that his father Tony had used some months previously. The miracle of unity is continuing. The word of God for the month is in the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter four, verses three to six. Be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit of unity, which continues to be at work between our churches. We thank you for all the men and women who have given their lives to be prophets for unity. Grant us, Father, being filled with your hope to be builders of bridges here where we are, that we may meet in the other of a different denomination, this brother, this sister, who you are giving us to love.